three years ago. On this very night, according to the Jewish calendar, the, the night of Nisan 14, the year of 33 CE, the disciples of the greatest man that ever lived gathered after sundown, just around about this time of day, in an upper room. And Jesus Christ gave to his disciples some counsel and some encouragement because he knew that on this night, all those years ago, that he would be arrested, he would be tried, he'd be tortured, and he'd be condemned to death. What would happen to Jesus over the next 24 hours was going to be something that would shape and affect the whole of mankind's history. We can look at world events today and uh, we can cast our minds to some things that have had significance. It may be that uh, we've seen wars, there have been natural disasters. Could be that governments have been overthrown or very prominent politicians have been assassinated and it's changed man's history. But nothing would change mankind's history as would what would happen to Jesus Christ over this 24 hour period. How was that so? Well, quite simply, if Jesus proved faithful to his God, faithful to what he'd been assigned to do, man would have a future. If he didn't, man would have no future whatsoever. Christ's sacrificial death provided mankind with an opportunity uh, that we'll look at a little later for a genuine future, to be restored to the condition that man's creator originally wanted, namely that life wouldn't end man would live in paradise conditions under a righteous government and theocracy. So with that in mind, the very last night of Jesus' life, he commanded that uh, his disciples would meet together and he inaugurated the meal that we are going to celebrate this evening. Let's just make sure that this was a command. If we turn to the book of Luke chapter 22, we see that this was definitely the case because in verse 19 just prior to the celebration of this meal it says and he, he took a loaf he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them his disciples saying this means my body which is to be given in your behalf keep doing this in remembrance of me so as Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, tonight we view this celebration without doubt as the most important in our annual spiritual calendar. And on this very night, over a 24-hour period, upwards of 13 million people, those that are Jehovah's Witnesses, those that uh, are associated with Jehovah's Witnesses, will be doing the same as we are. Might be not necessarily in the same comfort. Uh, in countries, for instance, where our work is banned, uh, individuals will still be meeting in this way. Others might be meeting in prison cells because of their Christian neutrality. Many will meet just the way we are. But that's how important we view this evening. So we're going to look at some questions. Why is it that uh, tonight's celebration is of such importance? Well, the very first reason is the thing that Jesus did by being faithful to the command given to him was that it vindicated Jehovah God's name. This was the most uh, important of issues that ever was, ever was brought up because not long after mankind had actually been created, God's old adversary, Satan the devil, threw a taunt and he said, man cannot and will not serve you faithfully. Jesus Christ proved that under extreme pressure and extreme conditions that a perfect man could indeed be obedient to God in a perfect way. Therefore, what Jehovah God asked of Adam, just obey me, that was all, proved that this was a reasonable request. There was nothing unreasonable about it at all. So that's the first reason we're here, because Jesus Christ demonstrated the importance of the vindication of his Father's name. The second reason was the benefits that then extended to mankind. Jesus' death revealed that Jehovah God had a plan for the earth and for the heavens. This could only be achieved by a perfect ransom. And on the basis of Jesus' faithfulness, many of the apostles over years and years wrote a theme in the Bible that showed a new covenant would be agreed 
between Jehovah God, Christ Jesus, and a specific number of individuals that would be taken from this earth. The Apostle Peter talked about it, the Apostle Paul talked about it. Let's just see uh, one account of this. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, and verse 9 and 10, Paul recorded these words. He says, In that he made known to us the sacred secret of his will, it is according to his good pleasure which he proposed in himself. For an administration at the full limit of the appointed times, namely, to gather together all things again in the Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth, yes, in him. What was Jesus referring to here? Well, the Apostle Paul demonstrated that he had complete confidence and faith that there would be a righteous administration. So what's an administration? Well, an administration is responsible for the management and policies of an organization. Simple as that. And this new covenant that was agreed by Jesus Christ's faithfulness with Christ as head was for a specific number, 144,000 members, to rule over mankind. We'll have a look at that a little later on as well. But this new covenant, as we said, would bring blessings to all of mankind on this earth. The third reason probably affects you and I more directly. Jesus' ransom made it possible for mankind to live forever in paradise conditions on this earth. Again, Jesus was specific about that. Let's just have a look at the book of John. There in John chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus recorded these words, or spoke these words. He said, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son in order that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed, but might have everlasting life. So we get a picture now, don't we, of uh, the benefits of Jesus Christ's death. When we talk about everlasting life, it's not life as we know it on this earth today, because uh, many of you and myself, we cope with circumstances and pressures in our daily lives that we were never ever designed to cope with. So living for an eternity with the pressures we contend with today, well, it wouldn't be very pleasant, would it? That wasn't what Jesus was referring to. What he was referring to is that mankind would revert back to the original way that man's creator designed him, to live forever on earth in beautiful conditions with people working together in harmony with each other and in harmony with all of Jehovah God's creation. How far removed we are from that today, aren't we? And what it needed was a corresponding sacrifice. Because of Adam's disobedience to Jehovah, that right to eternal life was lost. And by Christ Jesus proving faithful, he literally bought back that right for mankind and gave all of us an opportunity to live forever. So these are the three reasons that we find it important to be here this evening, the three main reasons. There are some others which we'll look at, as we've said a little later. Now what we're going to do to help us appreciate the significance of what was given was to take a look back at Jesus' life, his ministry, and uh, his attitude to things, because it helps us to get a picture of the type of people that we should or would like to be. So let's look back at the last few days of Jesus' life on this earth. The time of year was the springtime. Now, Israel is a little bit warmer than Scotland is, uh, so probably outside you would see flowers starting to bloom, trees starting to bud, and things would be that little bit further on than we are. The time of year was Nisan 9, six days before Jesus was to die. And uh, he and millions of other people were flocking into Jerusalem because this was a very important time of year for them. It was their Passover celebration. And there were Jews and proselytes. Proselytes were converted Jews coming from as far as Asia Minor across to Israel. Uh, some were coming up from Ethiopia. And right as far as across as Rome, they would congregate in Jerusalem. And along with them, Jesus Christ and the disciples were coming in. And uh, you can picture the scene. Probably it was the case that uh, the roads had all been cleaned up. 
Now the gravestones had been washed white because if you bumped into a gravestone by accident, you couldn't celebrate the Passover. You were unclean. Probably all of the houses you know, looked beautiful and that lovely spring smell was in the air as Jesus came in. And as he was riding in, things started to get a little bit exciting because people uh, took off their outer garments and they threw them onto the road for Jesus to ride across. Other individuals would cut down palm branches and also put them on the road. So they knew there was something special about this man. And the crowds, as they recognized him, they started to call out, Blessed is the one coming in the King's name, in Jehovah's name. And they shouted, Peace and glory in the highest places. Now as Jesus drew closer to Jerusalem, on seeing the city, he started to get quite emotional about the situation. Because when he catches sight of Jerusalem, the people, they, they start to shout out, saying, um, Peace, we, we want peace. Uh, intimating that Jesus had come to bring peace. And when he was just riding past them and ignoring them, some actually got a little bit angry. And they said, Can you hear what we're saying, Jesus? And Jesus replied, If you, even you, had discerned the things having to do with peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. Jesus knew that in the main, the Jews weren't really interested in peace. They were only interested in themselves. And they had been so willfully disobedient that they now had to pay the price for their disobedience. But what was it the Jews wanted? Well, rumors were spreading all around Jerusalem and Israel for many, many months. Many of the crowds, they've actually witnessed Jesus Christ resurrect Lazarus from the dead. Uh, they'd witnessed other miracles. And quite clearly, they knew that Jesus was a powerful man. That's why they shouted, Save us, O Son of David. Was their reasoning illogical? Well, think about it. Jesus had demonstrated the tremendous power that he had. But look at the time of year they were in, and look at what they were just about to celebrate. To them, it was the most important spiritual celebration of their year. They were about to celebrate the Passover. And they've been having a celebration for over 1,500 years. And they thought something significant was going to happen. Now, why should that be? Well, if you cast your minds back further, back to the year of 1513, you'll be aware of the account when the Jews inaugurated this celebration. It was the case that uh, millions of Jews had been anticipating something special. Moses had gone to Pharaoh and he'd said, uh, you've got to release my people. And Pharaoh was a very obstinate man and he was having none of it. And so on this same night, nice on the 14th, the Jews were in anticipation. They had slaughtered lambs and they got the blood and they daubed them over the lintels of their house. And then after they'd done that, they shut the door and they pre prepared for themselves a meal of the whole lamb, herbs, and bread. They got themselves dressed in their robes, their sandals were on, and they were waiting. And as midnight occurred, there was silence. Everyone was sleeping until something terrible happened. The account can be found in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 12, and verse 30, it says, Then Pharaoh got up at night, he and all his servants and others, the Egyptians. And they began a rising and great outcry among the Egyptians, because there was not a house where there was not one dead. At once, Moses and Aaron, they were called, they said, Get up, Pharaoh said, get out from the midst of my people, both you and the other sons of Israel, and go, serve Jehovah, just as you have stated, and take your flocks, take everything with you, just go. Now the Passover celebration was literally called this because the blood of the lambs had saved their life. When the angels saw the blood on the lintel above the door, he passed over, uh, so they didn't have to suffer the tragic consequences that the Egyptians did. Now how does this line up with what was about to happen to Jesus Christ and what we're celebrating this evening? Well, do you see the significance? The Jews thought at their Passover, Jesus had come to 
fight the Romans because Jerusalem was under bondage from the Romans. Jesus certainly was going to come to save people to liberate but certainly not in the way Jews thought. They wanted something physical and Jesus Christ pointed out that he was there to liberate them in a spiritual way. So we can see that their reasoning wasn't illogic but you can imagine their displeasure when they actually found out Jesus' real purpose. You're stuck with Roman bondage. The selfish ones would have quickly turned against him. And it was the case now that over the coming days, Jesus made for himself a lot of enemies. Because as soon as he got to Jerusalem, on nice and the ninth, he went straight into his father's house, the temple. And what did he see? Well, there they were, the money lenders. There were people selling... Uh, sacrifices. It was the case that over 200,000 lambs were actually slaughtered at the Passover celebration. And those individuals that had traveled for many miles and didn't bring anything with them, uh, these people were selling at exorbitant rates. And Jesus went wild with them and he turned over the table and accused them of turning Jehovah's house into a cave of robbers. Well, when the chief priests and uh, the principal ones heard about this, they'd had enough and they really plotted Jesus' death and downfall. Now the coming six days we're not going to look at in much detail other than to say that Jesus spent them doing three things. Now imagine the situation. Not only did Jesus know the kind of death he'd have to die, very, very painful, he also realized that if he messed up in any way, mankind's entire future would be gone. So that was another reason giving him anxiety. The third reason was that his relationship was so close with Jehovah God, he certainly didn't want to let his father down in any way whatsoever. But what did he do? Well, rather than concentrating on his problems, he encouraged his disciples to see the importance of prayer and faith, because he knew shortly he would go, and he'd always been there to help them, and now very shortly he wouldn't be. He continued to expose the religious wicked leaders. He did this not only face to face, but he also went into the temple and publicly exposed them with illustrations. And I thought this was the lovely point, that he concentrated on his ministry. Because he still was continuing to invite Jews to come in and be part of this new covenant, this spiritual Israel, and was very conscious of that. So what happened? Let's move right up to this Passover celebration. We move ahead to Nisan 13. The Jewish day ran from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. the next day. The religious leaders on that day continued to scheme against Jesus. Judas had already gone out. He'd done a deal with them. And the disciples were preparing for the Passover celebration. And Jesus now provides them with the most beautiful illustration. They'd been returning towards Jerusalem from Bethany, quite hot and dusty, and they were in an upper room, and Jesus Christ, he washes the feet of his disciples. Beautiful lesson in humility, because he even washed Judas' feet, knowing he was going to be the one to betray him. Now, after he'd done this, he recalled these words from Psalm 41 and verse 9. And he says, Also the man at peace with me, in whom I trusted, who was eating my bread, has magnified his heel against me. Now uh, the disciples became quite grieved at this. And they said, Who is it? Even Judas himself went and said, Who is the man that's going to do this? But within a very short period of time, Judas selected the moment, he crept out of the room and he scurried away. And it was at this point that Jesus Christ inaugurated this meal, the Lord's evening meal. Now we can read about this in the book of Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians, chapter 11. It was the Apostle Paul recalling these points. In verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was going to be handed over, took a loaf. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This means my body, which is in your behalf. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. He did likewise respecting the cup, also after having had the meal, saying, This cup means the new covenant 
by virtue of my blood. Keep doing this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until he arrives. So that was exactly what happened. Some people in uh, various religions today that have a similar type of celebration think that the wine actually is literally Jesus' blood. But that's not what Jesus said. It was symbolic. They think the bread is part of Jesus' body. But that's not the case, according to what the Bible says. What was pictured? Well, the unleavened bread that we'll look at tonight pictured the pure and unadulterated body that Jesus Christ was about to sacrifice. The wine pictured two things. It pictured Jesus' blood, but what it represented was that it took Adamic sin, which all of us had been born into, and it literally threw it away. It gave man the opportunity of everlasting life. And secondly, and most importantly, it validated this new covenant with Jesus Christ and a specific number, 144,000. And that's what we're celebrating this evening. The new covenant with spirit-begotten Christians, and literally, our own escape from death, if we want it. So who can partake of the bread and the wine this evening? Last year, 13,147,201 people that were either Jehovah's Witnesses or were interested in what we believe were at a memorial celebration on this night. Interestingly, only 8,645 actually partook of these emblems. So who are these ones that are in this new covenant? Turn with me to the book of Luke because we help, we're helped to get an understanding on this. In Luke 22 and verse 28, it says, However, you are the ones that have stuck with me in my trials, and I make a covenant with you just as my Father has made a covenant with me for a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at the table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Now these are the ones that are in the new covenant arrangement and have the right to partake of this this evening. There are only a small remnant of them remaining on this earth. And it, it is not the case that we can turn around and say, well, I'd like to be one of those individuals because the number has been set if you need clarification on it let's just turn to Revelation chapter 14 and this is John through a vision actually looking to heaven at such ones Revelation 14 and verse 1 says and I saw and look the lamb standing upon Mount Zion and with him a hundred and forty four thousand having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Where did they come from? Well, if you look down to verse 3, just about halfway down there, it says, And no one was able to master that song but the 144,000 who had been brought from the earth. So the majority of these ones have been sealed and selected. They are the ones that will reign with Christ, and they are the ones that will partake of the bread and the wine this evening. So for the majority of us, if not all of us here this evening, we're here to commemorate this, but we're not here to partake of this. Rather, it's the case that under this new covenant arrangement, we benefit in another way. Just have a look at Revelation 21. We've talked of the new covenant. Jesus Christ heads it. The 144,000 uh, rule with Jesus, and then those blessings filter down. And this is how it does it. It says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be them with them. And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, neither will mourning nor outcry, nor pain be anymore. The former things have passed away. And this is how we benefit from this arrangement. If, though, you have any further doubts as to whether you should 
partake of this this evening, we would have to ask five questions. And in turn, you would have to answer yes to all of these questions. Let me just read them to you. Have you made a prayerful dedication to Jehovah God through Jesus Christ? Have you followed by complete immersion in water as John baptized Jesus did? Are you regularly sharing in the preaching of the good news with fellow Christians as directed by Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 14? Have you set about arranging your life as Jesus counseled in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of peoples of all of the nations? And finally, and probably most importantly, can you explain how the Holy Spirit that's mentioned in Romans 8, 16 and 17 bears witness in your life? Now if you can't answer yes to all of those questions, then you have the opportunity of being one of the great crowd, but certainly not one of the individuals that are in this covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do now is to... Uh, celebrate this, we'd like to ask Brother 